Hello and welcome to Unworthy History. On today's episode, we're going to talk about some actual history from this book right here, The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace by John C. Duvall, Texas Ranger and Hunter. So in this story today, Bigfoot Wallace is going to tell of a battle that took place when he was head of a mail coach that was traveling from San Antonio to El Paso. I have been in many tight places, said Bigfoot, but when I was in charge of the mail coach running from San Antonio to El Paso, I got into one I thought I should never squeeze out of with a whole hide, but I did. We had been traveling hard ever since 12 o'clock at night in order to make the watering place at Devil's River, where I intended to noon it and graze our animals for two or three hours. After daylight, I noticed several Indian smokes rising up and disappearing, but apparently they were a long ways off, and once we passed a considerable trail, where at least 15 or 20 horses had crossed the road. Altogether, I didn't like the sign, and I told the boys to keep a bright lookout, as I felt sure the Indians were hatching some devilment for our benefits. However, we reached the water hole in safety about noon, watered all our animals, and hobbled them out to graze. I had eight men with me at that time, most of them old frontiersmen, who had seen much service and were as good fighters with one exception as ever drew a bead upon an Indian, for I had seen them tried on several occasions before. Near the watering place there was about a quarter of an acre of very thick chaparral, and after we had taken a bite to eat I told the boys to drag the coach up to the edge of it, and that they could then spread down their blankets and take a snooze, for they had been up all night before and were pretty well beat out. I was considerably fatigued myself, but somehow, although I had seen nothing in particular to excite my suspicion since we stopped at the watering place, I felt uneasy and determined to keep watch while the balance slept. If there had been nothing else, the appearance of the country around our encampment was enough to make one uneasy. The broken rocky hills covered here and there with clumps of thorny shrubs and stunted cedars, and little narrow valleys or canyons between them, in which there was nothing but a few patches of withered grass from which our poor animals were picking a scanty repast. On all sides, these rugged, rocky hills shut in the little canyon where we encamped, so that we could see but a short distance in any direction. I picked up my rifle and walked off to a little knoll about 50 or 60 yards to the right of our encampment, from which the best view could be had of the approach of an enemy, where I seated myself resolved that I would watch everything closely that looked at all suspicious. I don't know how it is with others, but with me there are times when I feel low-spirited and depressed without being able to account for it, and so it was on this occasion. The breeze rustled with a melancholy sound through the dead grass and stunted bushes around me, and the howling of a solitary coyote among the hills appeared to me unusually mournful. Nothing else could be heard except the snoring of Ben Wade in camp, who was one of the most provident men where eating and sleeping were concerned I ever met with. Notwithstanding all this, Ben was as true blue as ever fluttered, and would do to tie to when danger was about. Feeling pretty sure that it was about now, though I did not know exactly why, I determined to go and wake Ben up, and get him to help me bring in the horses and mules. Just as I came to this conclusion, I saw one of the horses raise up his head, and look for a long time in a certain direction, and a few minutes afterward a deer came running by, as if it had been frightened by something behind it. I waited long enough to see that no wolves were after it, and then I hurried to camp and gave Ben a shake by the shoulders. Get up, Ben, said I in a low voice, for I didn't want to wake up the other boys. Get up and help me bring in these horses. And between us we brought them all in and tied them securely in the chaparral, without waking up any of the other boys. After we had got them all well fastened, Ben laid down again to finish his nap but had scarcely coiled himself in his blanket when he sprang up as suddenly as if a stinging lizard had popped him. Cracky, he says. Cap, they're coming. I hear their horses' feet. I listened attentively, and sure enough, I could hear the sound of horses' feet clattering on the rocky ground, and the next minute we saw twenty-three Comanche warriors coming as fast as their horses could bring them right to our camp. 
In an instant, we had roused up the boys and were ready for them. They evidently expected to take us by surprise, for they never checked their horses until they had charged up within a few feet of the chaparral in which we were posted and began to pour in their dogwood switches as thick as hail. But we returned the compliment so effectually with our rifles and six-sheeters that they soon fell back, taking off with them four of their warriors who had been emptied from their saddles. They wounded one of our men named Fry, but not badly, and killed a pack mule. The Indians went off out of sight behind a hill, and most of the boys supposed that they had left for good. But I told them they were mistaken, and that we should have a lively time of it yet, that the Indians had only gone off to dismount and would soon come back again and give us another turn. And so it turned out, for we had scarcely got our guns and pistols loaded again, when they rose up all around the little thicket in which we were, yelling and screeching as if they thought we were a set of greenhorns that could be frightened by a noise. But I saw plainly they were earnest this time, and I told Ben Wade to take three of the boys and keep them off from the far side of the thicket, while I kept them at bay with the rest from the side next to the coach. We both had our hands full, I can tell you. I rather think we must have killed some noted warrior in the first charge they made upon us, and that they were bent on having revenge, for I never saw Indians come up to the scratch so boldly before. Three or four times they charged us with great spirit, and once they got right among us so that it was a hand-to-hand -hand fight, but the boys never flinched and poured the six-sheeter bullets into them so fast that they couldn't stand it long, and retreated once more out of sight behind the hills. During the time the Indians were charging on us fiercely, I saw one of my men skulking behind a bunch of prickly pear. I won't mention his name, for the poor fellow couldn't help being afraid any more than he could help getting a cold when a hard norther was blowing. Come out of that, said I, and stand up and fight like a man. Cap, said he, I would if I could, but I can't stand it. I saw by the way his lips quivered and his hands shook that he told the truth. So I said, for I really felt sorry for him, well, stay there then, if you must, and I'll say nothing about it. But some of the other boys noticed him too, and I actually believe, if I had not interfered, they would have shot him after that fight was over, and I might just as well have let them, for the poor fellow had no peace of his life after that. I have seen two or three men in the course of my life who were naturally scary-like, and they couldn't help it any more than they could help having bandy legs or a snub nose. They were made that way from the jump and they are more to be pitied than blamed. You might just as well blame a man because he isn't as smart as Henry Clay as because he isn't as brave as Julius Caesar. However, it is mighty aggravating to have them act in that way when the service of everyone is needed, as it was on this occasion. And, after all, they are generally more unlucky than those who are braver and expose themselves. With the exception of Fry, this man was the only one in the crowd that was wounded. An arrow went through his arm and pinned him hard and fast to the prickly pear behind which he was skulking. After the Indians had retreated the second time, the boys concluded, of course, that they had given up all idea of attacking us again, but I told them that I didn't think so, that I thought they would wait for us to make a start when they intended pouncing upon us at some place where we could get no shelter. But, said I, boys, we can soon satisfy ourselves about this, and I ordered every man to take his gun and lie flat down under the coach and keep perfectly quiet. The boys had begun to get a little tired of this position, except Ben, who was fast asleep, when suddenly we saw an Indian cautiously poke his head out of the chaparral, about seventy yards from where we were lying. He looked for a long time towards us, and seeing no one moving, he ventured out and stood straight up to have a better view. Don't fire at him, boys, I said. There will be some more of them directly, and we may yet get two or three. In a little while, another Indian stepped out by the side of the first, and then another and another, until five of them were standing side by side, all looking intently toward the coach, and wondering, I suppose, what had become of us. Now score em, boy, says I, and we let him have it. Four fell dead at the crack of our guns, and the fifth scrambled back into the chaparral as fast as if he had a heavy bet on doing it inside of a second. 
I told the boys to load up again as quick as possible, for that more of them would be sure to come out to take off the dead ones, but I made a miscalculation this time to a certainty. Not a thing could be seen or heard for fifteen or twenty minutes, when all at once we saw an arm rise up out of the bushes on the edge of the chaparral and make a sort of motion, and the next instant one of the dead Indians was snaked into the thicket, and I wish I may be kicked to death by grasshoppers if they didn't rope every one of them and drag them off in this way, and we can never see a thing except that Indian's arm motioning backward and forward as he threw the lasso. Boy, says I, that gets me. I've been in a good many scrimmages with the Indians, but I never saw them snake off their dead in that way before. However, I continued, it shows that they've had enough of the fight. And I think now we may venture to make a start, without any fear of being attacked by them again. But there was new danger ahead, as you will see. While the boys were harnessing up, I took my rifle and stepped out a short distance to reconnoiter. And well for us it was that I did, for on reaching the top of the little rise where I had first taken my stand, I saw and counted forty warriors coming down a canyon not more than four hundred yards off. I was satisfied it was not the same party we had been fighting, but a reinforcement coming to their assistance. They rode slowly along directly toward me, and when within about one hundred yards of me, I rose up from where I was sitting and showed myself to them. They halted instantly, and one of them, who I supposed was the chief, rode forward thirty or forty yards in advance of the rest, and in a loud voice asked me in Mexican, which most of the Comanches speak, what we were doing there. There is nothing like keeping a stiff upper lip and showing a bold front when you have to do so with Indians. So I told him we had been fighting Comanches, and that we had flogged them genteelly, too. Yes, said he, you are a set of sneaking coyotes and are afraid to come out of the brush. You are afraid to travel the road. You are all squaws, and you don't dare to poke your noses out of the chaparral. If you will wait till we eat our dinner, I answered, I'll show you whether we are afraid to travel the road. We shall camp at the California Springs tonight in spite of the whole Comanche nation. And with this, I turned around and slowly walked back to the coach, as if I didn't think they were worth bothering about any further. I was satisfied if I could only make them believe we had no fear of them, and that we would take the road again that evening for the California Springs, they would hurry on there for the purpose of waylaying us at that place. And so it turned out, for they immediately put off for the springs, eight miles distant, leaving only three warriors behind to watch our motions. When I got back to the coach, I told the boys what I had said to the Indians, and that I had no doubt that they would hurry off to the California Springs with the intention of waylaying us there, and that when I thought they had the time enough to make the distance, we would put out and take the back track to Fort Clark. They are too strong for us now, boys, said I, for they have had a reinforcement of forty warriors, and they will fight like mad to revenge the death of those we have killed. After waiting about half an hour longer, we took the road back to Fort Clark, instead of going on to the springs, and traveled as rapidly as we could urge our animals. Just as we started, we saw two of the warriors that had been left behind to watch our movements put off at full speed toward the springs, no doubt with the intention of letting the Indians know that we were taking the back track. The other, for they had left three behind, followed on after us at a safe distance from our rifles for seven or eight miles when we lost sight of them. We had so much the start of the Indians, and the road was so firm and good, and we rattled along at such a rate that they had no chance to overtake, even if they pursued, which I suppose they did. At any rate, we saw nothing more of them, and the next morning we reached Fort Clark safely, where our wounded men were taken care of. We had outwitted Mr. John completely. The commandant at Fort Clark furnished us with an escort of 12 men and a sergeant, and we made the trip back to San Antonio without any further trouble from the Indians at that time. So that's the end of this story. It was a pretty long story about a battle that Bigfoot Wallace had back when he was leading a mail coach from San Antonio to El Paso. So if you want to hear more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time here on Unworthy History.